Welcome back to the show, everybody. I cannot wait to share our guest with you today. We have Emily Harrington, and she is a speech language pathologist um, that's currently working on her PhD. And she has done much of her research and clinical work with emerging communicators. Now, there's probably some people thinking, what in the world is an emerging communicator? Well, if you listen to today's episode, you're going to find out. I think all of us as instructors or therapists in our field have had those participants that might not be communicating verbally yet. Maybe they don't have many words to tell us how they feel. Um, Maybe we're not even sure how much they understand uh, with the directions that we're giving. And that is all very important, especially when it comes to horses and the safety and things for for around those equine partners. So Emily is going to share all of that with us today, and I'm so happy you guys are here to listen to it. If you're listening to the Not Just a Pony Ride podcast, this is a community that's exclusive to the EAS industry, where we believe the magic that happens with our equine partners is not only fun for our participants, but it's a skill, a science, a business, and for so many of us, a place to belong. I'm your host, Katie Ott, OT and CTRI here at Hetra in Gretna, Nebraska, and I'm thrilled to bring you this episode today. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Emily. I'm happy to have you. Hi, thanks for having me. So it's good to see your face. I actually worked with Miss Emily in a previous life, um, and she is one of the best uh, speech language pathologists I think I've ever worked with. And so I'm happy to have her on the show today to share her wealth of knowledge. So Emily, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So my name's Emily Harrington. Um, As Katie said, I am a speech language pathologist. And when I was working clinically, um, I worked with kind of a variety of children across ages, uh, different diagnoses, but I've always had a pretty particular interest in children who are at that kind of like emerging communicator stage, Um, just kind of learning how to use their language and really thinking about how we can understand them and also support them in developing that communication system. Um, But that's a really fun population because there's lots of things we don't know about them, like how language develops, why some kids develop language faster than others. And those are questions I kind of wanted to think more deeply about. So for the last four years, I have been at the University of Illinois pursuing a PhD um, and really thinking about those types of questions. So I think about language development really from like birth to three years old both in children who are developing language typically and children who have some sort of language delay. And then also thinking about the types of supports that we can provide to um, therapists or caregivers to really help children with that language development process. I love that. So when you say emerging communicator, that could be really any age, right? Like It could be someone who is learning how to talk for the first time, like you said, typically developing, Mm -hmm. but can an emerging communicator also be someone that's older, like maybe, for example, someone on the spectrum or someone that's, you know, more delayed in language development? Yeah, definitely. So I think the term emerging, emerging communicator is a really useful one because it isn't locked by age. Um, So even like an example of kind of on the opposite end, uh, an adult who had like a brain injury could be an emerging communicator. Um, So that's a really great term. And I like to think about it as like a set of skills and how they're using communication more so than being like locked on a certain age range. Okay. Well, I'm excited today to talk to you a little bit more about specifically kind of those those emerging communicators and what skills we can help with as as a caregiver or as instructors that are in the field of EAS, because I think that's something that difficulty with communication can cause a lot of um, difficulty. Can you Mm -hmm. speak a little bit to what someone that is in that sort of emerging communicator phase of life and development, what kinds of things they might experience or you might see? Yeah, definitely. So I would say the first thing that comes to mind in terms of like difficulties is just like getting messages across, right? We use communication in so many different ways. And when we have a limited skill set that we have to communicate with, 
it's just really, it's a lot harder to get your wants, needs met, to get messages across to other people. And that can be incredibly frustrating. I mean, I think we've all experienced some sort of situation where we've been trying to get a message across to someone and it's not getting um, communicated in the way we want. And it's, and it's super frustrating. So I think there's definitely a level of frustration and not being able to get your message across. Um, I also think about the fact that when someone is emerging communicator, we think a lot about like the, the way they themselves are communicating, but the flip side of that is what they're understanding, what they're taking in. Um, and it can be, I, don't, I would imagine it'd be kind of scary, overwhelming to be in situations where you're not sure what is going on and the language that people are saying to you aren't isn't making any sense. You're not able to understand it. So I can imagine that that would be another area of difficulty as well. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing we really spend a lot of time looking at closely in EAS only because of the inherent risk, right? We're working with these large animals. And so we need our participants to be able to communicate with us um, like pain or discomfort or, you know, just their general wants and needs. And so if that communication breakdown isn't there, we need to find alternative ways or, um, something like that. So what would you say is a good, uh, way to find out, you know, maybe talking through the parent for the parents or just from a safety standpoint, some of those basic things. Yeah. So in terms of like them communicating to you that they're feeling unsafe, is that what yeah. you're asking? Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of time we have to kind of broaden our definition of communication for emerging communicators and really start to acknowledge the fact that really all behaviors are serving some sort of communication. So really starting to cue into these more subtle moments of communication. And that could be anything like something so subtle as like they're starting to look uneasy um, and really taking a step back and, and taking that for communication when a child isn't able to actually use the words like I'm uncomfortable, I'm nervous, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a huge one is really starting to tune in to these subtle communication acts that children might use. Um, on the kind of opposite end of that, a lot of times children who have difficulties communicating and who likely are feeling some sort of frustration because they can't get messages across have like really big behaviors that are serving as communication. And so really trying to figure out like what leads, what leads up to those big behaviors and making sure that we are giving that child the the respect that when they give us those those cues that a big mm -hmm. behavior is coming that we're listening to that child and responding again like it is communication because it absolutely is. Yes, I love that. So, I kind of always tell people we want to look for the sort of rumbling before an explosion mm -hmm. happens, mm -hmm. right? And so those rumbling sort of behaviors like you said it might just be like a look of uneasiness or maybe they start, you know, tapping their fingers or doing something. There's probably something if we look really closely um, that's happening before those larger behaviors happen, which in EAS is key because we want to avoid those larger explosions as much as we can, because it can impact our volunteers, our horses, and really make a situation unsafe. So um, I always ask my parents that come in, you know, if I have a emerging communicator, you know, what are some things that tell you they might be uncomfortable or what kind of those like rumbling behaviors do you see in them? Yeah, that's so true. I think parents are such a good informant for this um, because they have this expert knowledge on their child and they're able to see their child in tons of different types of scenarios. Um, so I also think it's really informative to kind of talk to caregivers about the other side of like how their child is communicating in their maybe like best or most preferred moments. Cause I think that can give us a lot of insight into how they might respond in, in times where they're feeling a little less, they're feeling a little uneasy or it's just a new situation. 
Yeah, I like that. I always think about asking, you know, parents like what happens when they're really upset or they're melting down or whatever it is, but also asking like when they're, you know, happy and in their, you know, most communicative, communicative state, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the flip side of that then. So we also need to be very cued into what kind of language that our participants are understanding. And I think number one, um, that is primarily again, because of safety, right? We need to understand Mm -hmm. like, we don't, we don't run around the horses. We don't, you know, hit our horses. We don't, you know, whatever the case may be, a lot of it is around safety. So can you speak a little bit to kind of that receptive language piece of things? Yeah. So I, it's a lot more difficult to figure out what a child truly understands. And there's a few reasons for this. So first children are pretty strong willed. So it might be hard to kind of tease apart what they're understanding and just choosing not to listen to versus what are they actually not understanding. And that's, that's a piece that's really hard. I mean, that's, they, there's totally a right to listen to something and say, mm, no, I don't really no, want to you. do that and not do it. Um, and we can't chalk that all up to like language difficulties. There's certainly a level of just like, this is not a direction that I am willing to follow right now. Um, they can also be really good at coming up with strategies, whether that be subconscious strategies, like ways to kind of get through life that mask what they can actually understand. So children can get really good at using like routines and context to make it seem like they're understanding a lot more than they actually do. So like an example might be um, for a parent, they might say every morning when the child is getting ready for school, they might say, go get your backpack and shoes. And every morning the child does that. But at a different time of day, when they're not getting ready for school, They might say, go get your backpack and shoes, and they get like a blank stare from the child because the child maybe doesn't actually understand that direction. They just understand the context and they know what's expected of them in that context. So that's another hard piece. Um, And but it's actually a strength too. like we can use those types of things as a way to really augment what a child understands and reinforce Um, that too right mm -hmm. like eventually maybe those words will become more familiar because you use them in a routine and in a context yeah definitely definitely so there's always like two sides of it like it makes it hard for us to maybe definitively say what does this child understand versus what do they not but it also gives us some really good strategies that we can use um the same thing goes for like if a child is really good at picking up on like nonverbal cues, like gestures, facial expressions, they might be able to kind of get along and sort of follow what's going on in the moment because they're able to uh, maybe watch what someone else is doing and just kind of copy what they're doing. And they don't understand the language at all. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a strategy that we can use, but it also makes it hard to kind of piece apart what they're truly understanding. Right. So when I always think about, and this is my non, my non-speech language pathologist brain, right? So it's like, I wonder if this participant is understanding me. So I'll ask them to do like maybe simple, like gross motor cues, like put your hands on your helmet or whatever it is, you know, and kind of see what happens. But I, I think that what you said about kids are being strong-willed is resonating so much with me right now because Mm -hmm. emerging communicators are the same as those who, you know, communicate in a typical way in that I may decide to ignore you (laughs) and I don't want to. And how do we get through that? Right. Yeah. And, and another piece of that is like communication and the way we communicate with each other is like really has a purpose. And so when we give sort of these like decontextualized directions, like touch your helmet and the child might not understand why they're being asked to do that. It might be something that they just don't follow through with because they're like, I don't really get why she would be telling me to do that right now. So I'm just not going to, because I'm just confused all around. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like I think thinking about how can we infuse 
directions or statements that really relate to the activity and also relate to the child's interests and would be something they would do anyway, um, that might give lead us to a better route of like, they're gonna actually complete that direction if they understand it. And if they don't complete that direction, it might actually be because they're not understanding your language, not because they're not choosing to do it. Okay. So give me like an example of that. Like I'm trying to think of like an example of like using, using something that's like within an activity or with, or within like something that motivates them to kind of tease that out. Yeah. So I can definitely give an example that's related more to like a play activity. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. So like if we were playing with a like train set, let's say, and this child loves a train set and it's maybe a new type of train um, that, that magnet magnet together. So like all the trains magnet together and they're laying out across the room. At one point I might say something like put the train together. And if the child already, I already know the child loves trains. Like I already know they're super engaged in this activity. They're focused on the activity and they kind of just give me like a blank stare. That gives me a pretty good indication that they didn't understand that direction. Mm -hmm. So like my next step might be that I myself would take the two trains and I would maybe click two together and say, oh, I put the train together Mm -hmm. and then gesture towards them and say, put the train together and see if they would do it. Um, That way I'm adding some like physical support, some gesture support and probably increasing the likelihood that they're going to actually follow that direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I'm going to do it for EAS and tell me if I'm doing it correctly. Okay. Let's put on our helmet, like put on your helmet. And if, you know, then eventually that that's a routine. Every time you come to ride, we put on our helmet. And so like understanding that direction and following through with that. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, I could imagine there are some kids who maybe don't like putting on their helmets. Um, and so that's another one where it's like, we're sort of piecing apart. Like, is this something they just don't want to do? Is it something they don't understand? But again, like this is something that they have to do Mm -hmm. um, in order to engage in this activity. And so trying to find maybe a more fun and engaging way or a fun and engaging routine that that direction can be embedded into might help that child uh, do that less preferred task. Yeah. So give me a tip on how to identify, and we talked about it just a little bit, but so let's take that same example. So I say, let's put on our helmet, you know, it's time to ride and I don't get any action or any, you know, kind of, I can't tell if they don't want to, or if they don't understand me, give me a tip on something I might look for or something that might help if, if I can't tell. Yeah. I think the biggest thing you can do is start to incrementally add supports and see how the child responds. So if the child, I just give a verbal direction, put on your helmet and the child doesn't do anything, I might take, I might have like a helmet that would be for me with me. And I would say like, I'll put on my helmet, put on my helmet and then gesture to him, put on your helmet. Mm. If there still isn't a response, we might have a little bit more information that maybe they understand it and don't want to do it or they might, they might not still understand it. And so I think my next step would be actually like, you know, labeling the helmet, like Mm -hmm. helmet, you know, and then talking to him about, all right, put on the helmet and really like pointing to the helmet, making sure I have like the really good representation of what that word means right in front of me to give a little bit more support. Yeah. in context. So tell Mm -hmm. me how, like how visual supports might play into some of the things with emerging communicators? Yeah. So I would say the best visual support you can give an emerging communicator is the actual object. Mm. Um, There is a level of, uh, I can't think of a better word than abstraction, which is basically when you take a a real object and you make it into a picture, Mm -hmm. it's less concrete. It's harder to understand because it's no longer the actual object. So that's going to be more difficult to understand the word when it's depicted as a picture. The actual object is always going to be the best 
thing that you can use. Um, another reason is because pictures don't always like, especially if we're using like a cartoon picture, mm-hmm. those look really different than the real thing. Um, so just thinking about the fact that for children who maybe have a hard time understanding language, they're likely also going to have a hard time understanding more abstract pictures. And so the real object is always going to be the best bet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we talk about that a lot with um, our participants who have autism is that kind of transference of, you know, a horse has a mane and a tail and a Clydesdale and a mini horse are the same because they have a mane and a tail, right? So kind of that like transference of, I don't know what you call that in speech, speech <laughs> language terms, but it doesn't, those two things don't make sense as a horse because one's big and one's small and what the heck, you know? So Same thing kind of with pictures and real objects, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This podcast is sponsored in part by Wooden Horse Corporation and the Equisizer. The Equisizer, a handcrafted, non-motorized mechanical horse, is currently being used by hundreds of equine assistance services programs worldwide. The Equisizer requires no electricity, tools, or maintenance and can be used anywhere, indoors or out, for evaluations, warm-ups, stretching before lessons, mounting and dismounting practice, emergency procedures, or volunteer training. The Equisizer can also aid in reducing fear and building confidence for both students, clients, and volunteers. It can easily carry the weight of two adults, offering the option to ride tandemly for those riders who may need more support. To learn more about the Equisizer for your equine-assisted activities, visit Equisizer.com. That's E-Q-U-I-C-I-Z-E-R.com. Yep. Okay, so tell me a little bit about how we can motivate our participants to want to communicate with us versus using different behaviors or different things, even though we're not speech language pathologists, right? As instructors where, um, our horse, our participants are riding horses and we just need to communicate with them. They need to communicate with us in the best way possible. Um, so how can we motivate them kind of on a, on a more basic level? Yeah. So I think the best thing that the best motivator for motivating someone to communicate is reinforcing the communication attempts that they that they make. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that is so cool about communication is that it is the thing that really allows us to connect with others. And that is true, like across the age span, across disability, um, it is it is so powerful. And it can actually be this really naturally reinforcing thing if we treat it for what it is, and that is, you know, sending a message, um, getting to be, you, getting to request what you want, what you need, getting to be creative with the types of messages that you send to people. And the only way that a child is going to know that that's working is if they get some sort of response or reinforcement. And the best way to do that is by actually following through with what they've communicated about. Um, so of course, you know, sometimes people think of reinforcement as just like a good job. You said, you know, the word, but truly, if we think about how like adults communicate with each other, it feels good when you tell someone a story and they respond to it by, you know, adding to that story or giving you more information about it. So kind of thinking about that in terms of children, when they request something, if we can give it to them, we sh- we should. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we can't, we should offer something that's maybe equally as preferred um, to really try and reinforce the communication that they are using. Mm-hmm. Yes. So tell me about when. So I'm thinking of a participant that I have that sometimes will request like a common phrase like, I want to drink or I want to go to the bathroom or whatever the common phrase is. If we can't deliver something like that and there's really no like <laughs> equal thing that I can mm-hmm. do for them at that moment, what's something that we can do to sort of like reinforce the communication piece, right? Like I like that they're using words, but, but you know, we can't. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, that gets ho- That's a tricky piece. So I would say just trying to first acknowledge what they said. So if they said, like, I want a drink, you know, even just saying, oh, a drink, and then just and then giving them a concrete time or, you know, 
opportunity that they can get a drink. Like, oh, you want a drink? We'll ride the horse and then we'll go get a drink Mm -hmm. um, to try and make them understand that like, I've heard what you've said and I am saying yes. The yes is just going to be a little bit delayed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that that's something that like instructors that are listening, we have volunteer teams that work with our horses and something that we could easily tell um, our volunteers to help us with, because we're not always right next to our participants, especially if we're in like a group. Um, but acknowledging that kind of social engagement and saying, you know, just, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like reinforcing that statement. And then, but you know, we're doing this or whatever, and we'll do it later or whatever that case may be. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm not super familiar with like the the flow of sessions, but if there's a way that if there's an option to sort of maybe cut whatever you're doing a little bit short so that that child can get reinforced a little bit quicker, um, that would be ideal, honestly, because then that's really showing them that their, their communication is powerful and is going to help them engage in the session that they're at. Um, before there's a way to like take a break earlier, if there was one maybe planned for later in the session to move it up when they communicate, like that would be ideal. I know Mm -hmm. that's not always like not always possible, but, but yes, would be helpful for sure. So are there any other tips that you give like families or caregivers, um, for emergency, emergency, (laughs) emerging communicators, um, that might be helpful for like our instructors or lay people that are listening, um, just to help motivate and encourage and, and continue communication. Yeah. I think my biggest one would be to always like never shy away from like a behavior to, to reinforce it and kind of shape it as communication. So even if it's something that maybe doesn't even look like communication. So for example, I have worked with children whose parents have said like, they have no functional communication. Like they kind of just, you know, like cry or maybe sometimes they'll like kick their legs and there's just nothing that I, I never know what they want. Um, in sessions, I, if a child starts, let's say like kicking their legs, I will treat that like communication. Um, and either if I, like, I can tell their facial expression is like happy. I'm going to treat it as like, uh, I want to keep doing whatever we're doing. I'm going to say, Oh, you look so happy. Let's keep, let's keep playing. Let's keep doing whatever. Um, if I'm seeing some frustration and some kicking, I might say something like, oh, it looks like we need a break and just kind of taking a break. So any behavior I think is a great way to sort of get more information on that child. You might not always interpret their behaviors correctly. And that's also okay because it gives you information about what you might do the next time, right? Mm -hmm. Like if that child uh, was kicking and smiling and I interpreted it as like they wanted to keep doing the activity we were doing, And then um, they like took the toy and threw it across the room. I probably got that one wrong and that's okay. I now have more information for the next time of what that kicking behavior might potentially mean. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a level of um, social engagement that's inherently motivating there too, right? Where it's like... I'm thinking of like a participant that is, you know, mostly nonverbal, kind of like you were explaining, like they have, you know, maybe little noises they make or, um, something like that. And so sometimes like, if I see a big smile and then you look at them and smile back and say like, yeah, I'm happy too. Then it's like, they're more motivated than to want to try and communicate with that with you or, or engage with you in that social way. And that can be motivating too. Yeah, definitely. I think the other thing is using um, moments of children not communicating as an opportunity to kind of give them some of the words that they might want to use in future sessions. Mm -hmm. So if you have a child who isn't using any spoken language and doesn't, you know, say anything or really make any noises during the ride, you might start to use just like simple words and statements during the session to try and give them the words that they could potentially use in the future. Um, Especially, I have no good examples for this because I am not in the field, but 
Um, I can imagine maybe like sometimes does the horse go like faster or slower? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> so if that's something you, you see like the child likes when the horse goes a little bit faster, you might say something like, let's go faster. And then, you know, the horse can move a little bit faster and say things like, Ooh, I like the fast horse. Mm -hmm. Um, giving them those words that they could potentially use in the future. Yeah, for sure. I love that. And the horse and horses going faster are a great motivator for us generally. Um, so we use a lot of that, um, I would say therapeutically, and I think it'd be great for instructors to be using that too, because honestly, a part of horsemanship is being able to communicate with our horses, whether that be through our seat or our legs or our reins or using our voice. So, um, that is a great thing to continue to work on. So I have a question about, there's a lot of like nuanced terms, right. In horsemanship and like going faster would also be something like walk up or a trot or like, for example, walk, like walk on means go, you know, for a horse okay. to go. So for some of our emerging communicators, what would your recommendation be? Would it be to use more basic terms that apply globally or to really use the words that are relevant to the, the activity or the, the atmosphere that you're in? That is such a good question. Um, I'm, I feel a little torn. I am leaning more towards maybe more universally applicable terms like, you know, go, for example. Um, but I think just because they could potentially be using that word in lots of different scenarios and be getting like the same types of reinforcement we're talking about in a session, they might be getting reinforcement for the word go during a play activity or um, on a car ride. And so then they're able to really kind of cement that word into their vocabulary and be able to use it across situations. So I think that's maybe the case for more universal words. But I also could see a case for more context specific words because of um, it, it depends on the child for sure. But if a child is a, a child who does do really well in certain contexts, um, potentially teaching new routine and context specific language could be useful for that child. Um, so these are words that don't have any other really meaning to them. They're really specific to the activity. And that could again be something that motivates the child to use them if they really love this routine and activity. Yeah. So if there's a case for both. I think it's really probably dependent on the child and maybe talking to the parents about what, how they're using some of those words like go and fast, if they're using them a lot and um, it's something that's reinforcing and motivating for them, it might be useful to use those same terms in the session. If they're not using any words, it might be useful to try um, some of these more context specific words. Yeah. I'm thinking of, it just brought a smile to my face because I was thinking about one participant that I have that um, would ha she has more words in her day to day, um, but not as many when we ride. And so we did, um, I did go ahead and we learned walk on and, um, and her mom had messaged me like a week or two, you know, after our sessions had started and she said, I wanted you to know that from the other end of the house this morning, I heard walk on smoky. <laughs> <laughs> so they will transfer oh, eventually. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. And I think on that note, there there could be a case to make for using words that the child already knows and is motivated by, even if they maybe don't 100% fit like the scenario. Mm -hmm. um, it I think it totally depends on like the goals of the session. And if there's, if there's a, a real need for the child to verbally communicate, and that's like the number one priority, then we might have to get a little creative and think about words that they're already using and how we can kind of embed them into the, the situation. Yeah, for sure. Well, I have gotten so many golden nuggets of information from you today, Emily. I appreciate <laughs> your willingness to be on the show and yeah. um, especially for you, you know, not having any background in EAS, but the things that you offered us today are more than applicable across so many scenarios. So I appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Okay. Well, before I let you go, we end all of our podcasts with a different question every season. And this season, the question is, 
Emily, what is your golden rule? So if someone were to remember you for just one thing across your, your career or your life, what would you hope that that would be? I really think that it would be like, if you have a curiosity or a question, you should ask it and you should go find an answer to it. Um, I think that applies in so many different areas of our lives and is something that just has kind of carried me throughout life. Like following those lines of curiosity have really been helpful for me. And I think that everyone should go do that. I love that. And that knowing you as a personally and professionally, I would say that totally makes sense. And that's what (laughs) people are going to say for sure, (laughs) especially in your research background. What's before I let you go, I need to know what exciting thing are you researching right now? I am researching. Oh gosh. I have a couple projects. I think the one that I'm most excited about is I am researching how children and parents use verbal imitation when they are interacting with each other. So it's really common for caregivers to imitate their children. Um, It's also really common for children to imitate their caregivers and imitations serve lots of different purposes and potentially help with language development. And so I just want to get a lot of information on how they're using it, why they're using it, and kind of what that looks like within a play activity. Interesting. So I'm really excited to kind of get more information into how children use that as like a strategy and also what it can tell us about their language. Very cool. Well, I will stock the publications (laughs) looking for your name here one of these days on that. Yes. All right. Well, thanks for stopping by, Emily. I know you're a busy lady and we appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge with us all. Yes. Thank you so much. That's all for today. But until the next episode launches, scroll down to the show notes and click on the link to get plugged in with us on Facebook, Instagram, or our exclusive educational club at Patreon. This podcast is presented by Hetra University, the educational arm of Heartland Equine Therapeutic Writing Academy in Gretna, Nebraska. Hetra University's mission is to provide high quality educational offerings to the EAS community. Check out all the Hetra University has to offer at www.hetrauniversity.org.